let me uh, begin by saying that I track uh, developments uh, pretty much every day in terms of the tumultuous environment in which we now find ourselves. And there was a report that just came out of a major group uh, up north from here. I won't name names. Looking at the 12 greatest global risks that we are looking at uh, in the world today. And as an overarching conclusion, the authors who are normally credible people made the point that 2024, this year right now, is the year that we can call Voldemort year. <laughs> the year that cannot be named, they said. They called it the Annus Horribles, the horrible year, for a number of reasons. But I'm here to tell you that no, you don't have to uh, order a magic wand or uh, sign up to Slytherin right now, uh, House. <laughs> that uh, we need to be thinking, you and I, about not only admiring the problems, but also admiring the opportunities and then defining, identifying solutions beyond that. So what I'd like to do in that spirit tonight is to talk to you about how we perceive the uh, state of the world right now, and then to talk about these important sounding words on this poster, countering adversity with innovations because there's some very significant innovations at work right now, not only tech, but as important as those are, but looking at uh, policy and broader social innovations, uh, economic, et cetera, that we can talk over. So please uh, load your weapons with respect to questions or comments or uh, contestations of uh, what I suggest here. Um, I'd really like to hear from you, and I think we all will be the better for it if we have a good conversation. So let's begin then, uh, setting aside the magic wand by thinking about where the world is going over the next few years. Now, the way I see it, we're moving into a whole new geopolitical space right now. When I was your age, God forbid, I know, when I was your age, uh, the fact of the matter was uh, that the world moved into a wholesale new paradigm with respect to political and economic liberalization. There's a scholar, perhaps you've read him, uh, I know him well, Frank Fukuyama at Stanford, who wrote way back when in 1989, wrote, a, wrote an article that later uh, he expanded into a book called The End of History. How dare he say that, The End of History. But the point of view was that we had reached the end of the, the ignominious uh, Soviet challenge uh, to the United States. The Cold War was no more. And the bottom line was that broader political liberalization, democratization, economic liberalization, those were the predominant stories of the day. And any other kind of history was, uh, was finished, was ended. Well, here we are now, some 30 plus years later, and I would argue that we've reached the end of the end of history. While I developed over the course of my career, I was at the think tank, as Marina kindly uh, described, uh, working with uh, a number of policy figures over the years and thinking through uh, the intersection of politics and economics. And that logic, that underlying logic, rapid globalization, liberalization, uh, renunciation of economic statism, whole range of other areas that uh, countries were engaging in prior, prior to that big shift, the end of history, um, all of that kind of conditioned where we were over the years. Now it's changing. Now we've got a uh, whole uh, a, a variety of different uh, economic and political and geopolitical and other balances that we're dealing with. So the new geopolitics. Way back when, China was really not on the map. Uh, we began to see the liberalization of the Chinese external economy under Deng. 
I remember many of us were tracking this thing called state-owned enterprises in China, thinking how the devil are these things going to work longer range? And what followed shocked all of us in terms of the sweeping transformation that we saw for China uh, across the board. Probably, at least over my lifetime, who knows uh, on yours, but at least in my lifetime, I think that probably that would be the defining feature of how the human family changed its condition over a relatively short period of time. That is a big thing, but now we stand at a completely different balance. What was a nascent China then is a massively powerful one now. Which country, ladies and gentlemen, has the biggest navy in the world? China. China. 340 hulls going up to about 400 uh, targeted by the end of uh, 2030. While the US and the Soviet Union, now Russia, of course, had a preponderance in terms of strategic and, and tactical nuclear weapons, what country now is doing more nuclear testing than the rest of the world combined? And China, and China. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of uh, testing to be sure. In Korea, we're also seeing uh, hyper weaponry right now, which is quite extraordinary. Bottom line is that what was a dual, uh, 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 a two power world during the pre end of history period, and then became a unipolar world, my French friends. Reluctantly, uh, uh, would uh, would uh, uh, quote a general in France who referred to the U.S. once as an hyperpuissance, a hyperpower. But now we're beginning to see a much more equal distribution of power, a broader economic strength, the range of other factors governing how the international economy develops, how the international rules structure evolves, and a whole range of other factors that are going to condition your lives, whether you like it or not. So from my point of view now, and I won't go on too much in each of these areas, but from my point of view in the geopolitical space, you and I stand at a remarkable moment now, this end of the end of history, because if we look at the world's uh, six preeminent powers, the four that we saw prior to the uh, collapse of the Cold War, that's U.S., Soviet Union slash Russia, Europe, and Japan. And then we add China and now India to the mix, those six countries. Each one of them now stands at a remarkable moment with respect to its own national inflection. In this country, who here, who in this room is ready to describe the nature of US engagement in light of the division that we see these days in the political space. Anybody brave enough to reach a conclusion? I, I, I'm not, I'm not. I used to work uh, years ago with a senator uh, from uh, the state of Georgia, Sam Dunn, who used to joke that in Washington, you can't take friendship personally. Now that was way back then. Now, it's remarkable in terms of the hyper-partisanship that govern us, governs us on virtually every issue. And I don't think any of us here, no matter where we stand on the political spectrum, can blame it on either the right or the left. Uh, in the end, what we're seeing now in a lot of uh, areas of U.S. engagement with the rest of the world we're seeing what I call politics by ever wider standard deviation. So we're seeing positions that are more and more extreme on both sides of the political spectrum play themselves out. Do you think right now, if you were in the White House and you wanted to put a trade agreement through, do you think you could do it with this Capitol Hill? Answer is absolutely not. And is it only because of one side or the other? Or is it because of both, resounding because of both? And the fact of the matter now is that the nature of our engagement with the rest of the world is in flux big time. And you and I will be seeing that uh, in the months to come uh, up to the, uh, the uh, presidential election in uh, November. 
if that's the U.S., then what about Russia? Uh, Russia is trying to define its post whatever identity. Now. We've seen that from a historical and a social and a broader geographical standpoint. And really, it remains to be seen now what kind of Russia will emerge from this tragic uh, attempt at hegemony uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, where it's going to go longer range. If you think about China now, we are seeing Xi Jinping uh, uh, with a, an economy that has slowed after that remarkable period. We're now seeing growth. Uh, we're projecting uh, the next four, five, six years in the 4% range, which is substantially below the 7%. At one, one year, you know, you never know about the, the, the economic data uh, precisely from uh, China. But one year, the reports were that they topped 10%, double-digit growth. Well, they're, they're beyond that. And now the operative question is, as that economy becomes more sophisticated, more mature, uh, in effect, it will be slowing down gradually. And that will create new predicaments for the leadership there, some of which are already beginning to visit themselves on uh, China. So how will the state continue to guard its legitimacy on the one hand, its political legitimacy, and then deal with a whole range of broader economic challenges from the real estate pressures it faces now to um, uh, uh, significant uh, debt uh, implications, especially at uh, local levels. Uh, they're going to have their hands full. If we think now about Europe, we need to be asking ourselves the question, what Europe? Are we talking about Mr. Orban's Europe in Hungary or the Europe that we see from the prospect of London or Paris or, or Berlin? And the answer is that in each of these cases, you get very different answers. Um, we lost the great uh, statesman, Jacques Delors, uh, who uh, died uh, not too very long ago. And uh, Delors, to me, uh, his efforts, his position, his character was emblematic of the influences that pulled Europe together. And it begs the question, now that he's gone, who, who's doing that? Where, where are the elements drawing together uh, the new Europe? Japan is now dealing with a range of uh, issues under Prime Minister Kishida, including, not least of which, is what do they do in terms of a military position uh, in an Asia where China has increased its strength so significantly? And it's flexing its muscles in the South China Sea in very significant ways. So the point here is that each one of these countries, I mean, we're always at some kind of an inflection point, let's face it. But each of these countries now has reached a fundamental one. And it's all happening at the same time. It will all play itself out as you continue your study here and as you move into the workforce and move into the rest of your lives. Now, on the economic side, I think that probably the jolt that we saw post-pandemic last year uh, is going to be gone this year. Not Voldemort. We don't have to worry about that. The U.S. economy um, is holding things up reasonably well right now, and we can expect um, probably a, a significant uh, uh, a monetary um, stimulus in uh, in Beijing to kind of jumpstart their economy there. But the trend growth for the world right now will be substantially below this year, will be substantially below where it was last year. And our projections through the end of the decade suggest a decline, including in many developing countries now, debt obligations that are going to create a whole set of new challenges. So much so that the World Bank uh, issued a report recently uh, highlighting the potential for a quote unquote lost decade through the end of uh, this decade to 2030. Maybe, maybe not, you know, again, we don't need magic wands. We need uh, good innovations going forward. In the environment, we're seeing a number of, uh, of uh, issues at work. 
it was hard to read any newspaper or credible journal at the end of last year without seeing one after the other after the next record being broken, whether it was temperature, extreme weather, or regional other factors. My guess is that many of you are tracking this really carefully. And then think about technology. Uh, well, most of us are trying to get uh, the Zoom technology out in the conference room here. The upshot, the upshot is that you and I are hurtling now toward Q year when we see quantum begin to make mincemeat of the kind of binary zeros and ones that uh, I grew up uh, on. I mean, that world, which will be your next world, will be totally different. Add to that the CRISPR revolution, when we're seeing genetic, uh, genetic editing a la massive amounts. Uh, we're beginning to see new genetic medicines by the day right now. I've come to know a Nobel laureate, Jennifer Doudna, uh, from uh, the University of California. Uh, if you ever want to read a good book, uh, get her book, A Crack in Creation. Or read, or read Walter Isaacson's biography of her, uh, Jennifer Doudna, and you'll see just what a revolutionary she is. That whole notion of biotech right now, add to that massive computational power, add to that a whole range of other areas that you're wondering why I'm not talking about AI. Of course, I'll mention artificial general intelligence, which is the next threshold that we'll all be getting to. Internet of things, internet of all things is the next stage there. It will be one thing after the next that will revolutionize your world. And then finally, there's the question of how we deal with our political systems. This is the mega year 2024 of elections, the epic test for where we are and where we're going. Uh, you know, I, the numbers, uh, it depends, you know, who you believe, but probably 60% uh, of humanity will have the opportunity to vote. Some of those will be democracies, others uh, not exactly democracies. But uh, this year will be a big political transition year. But I think that that may mask the things that probably you feel already in this room. How much confidence how much trust do you have in national governments? Would you prefer to put your trust in non-governmental organizations, NGOs or scientific groups or uh, God forbid, private sector? Uh, bottom line here is that the data show that especially younger generations now are shifting their loyalties away from governments and toward private sector private organizations, including uh, NGOs. And I, I can understand why. I can understand why. If you look at uh, the politics of dysfunction, not very far from here, uh, it's pretty hard to find anything from which to draw inspiration. So if we use these ideas to think forward about what the core trends are for the next five years, I think we can begin to think about what kind of innovative approaches now that we need to counter adversity. So with that by way of background, I'm going to very quickly rattle off five areas that we think are especially interesting and maybe that things that uh, some people haven't thought of uh, that we need to be paying attention to over the next five years. What are they? So think about it. We're talking five years out. The first one is a function of that environmental degradation that I talked about before, and it's biodiversity loss. Uh, the key question here is how can we prevent the continued rapid extinction of species across the world? And there are so many elements of our health and our lifetimes that are contingent on how well we do this. Now, what we highlight in our report is that uh, our negligence of biodiversity um, are by our, our, own, uh, our own inaction, uh, continued accelerated loss, carries with it very significant economic costs. 
Um, we highlight a World Bank report that suggests that degrading ecosystems could trigger a downward spiral of about $2.7 trillion in annual global output uh, by the end of the decade. And that will accelerate even further thereafter. So the question then is, what do we do about it? We just put together a major convention, a major treaty on protecting biodiversity, but in effect, we don't see the ratification by national governments that we'd like to see, including the, the big one close to here, uh, that will have a big uh, effect ultimately on how rapidly we can address the program. Point number two, uh, we call it industry policy. Uh, the vast majority of you are too young to remember this, uh, but some time ago, there were a number of developing countries as well as developed countries that engaged in protecting industries, uh, diverting mass subsidies, uh, and uh, creating other ways uh, to, uh, in effect, nudge uh, critical industries uh, to the front of the line in terms of uh, economic development. During this period of the end of history, a lot of that went away. Statist economic policy fell out of uh, favor. Uh, but now it's coming back with a vengeance. And the fact of the matter is, especially post-pandemic, the fact of the matter is that in a number of poor areas not related only to national security energy, which was the area where the industry policy focused most in the past, now it's in a whole number of areas. The CHIPS Act in semiconductor uh, production is a classic example of one major economic titan taking on another in terms of defining who has the high ground in, uh, in semiconductors. Um, I think that this industry policy is likely to intensify in the years ahead, and uh, it will become more and more difficult um, to uh, uh, for us uh, to uh, to uh, uh, continents uh, international trade uh, and investment. Years ago, U.S. Chair, U.S. Trade Representative, right? Years ago, I was on a plane and I sat next to a former U.S. I won't name his name, uh, but um, we were talking about uh, tariffs and non-tariff barriers, and uh, I asked him. Well, what do you think? You know, the, the, the more we get populism and nationalism, the more that flares up, the more we're likely to see industrial policy, right? And he said, absolutely. And we'll only learn with difficulty that we do not want to be a nation of pajama makers. We do not want to be a nation of pajama makers. What did he mean by that? Well, the, the margins on making pajamas aren't very large, probably, or at least he didn't think they were. And in the end, it's a question of finding ways to inject new levels of productivity into the uh, economic outlook. And you don't do that by doing what's been done uh, for years and years and years without uh, beginning to have uh, significant rapid changes. Well, uh, I'm tired of seeing jokes. Maybe, maybe you saw them also uh, during the uh, Grammy performance last night. Uh, but there were jokes about Boeing and, and uh, doors flying off uh, their planes. Uh, I've had enough of that as a flyer, and I always get the seat next to an emergency accident. <laughs> but we think that rapid transit is going to be a very big deal in the next five years. So we'll be looking at Factor mobility in terms of human factor. We'll be able to do get places, different places, faster in better ways. Um, flying cars, hyperloops, other innovative rapid transit systems, we believe are likely to take on new momentum uh, in the years ahead, especially as we move from this big transformation from fossil to electric to EV in terms of uh, our core uh, car fleet. Two more, unlocking the value of e-waste. How many computers here at the University of Maryland 
are dumped at the end of the, every year because they're no longer working or they've uh, been knocked off and uh, just, uh, no longer functional or whatever may happen to be. Uh, E-waste is a very significant challenge, but by the same token, it's a great opportunity. And we think that somewhere on the order of something north of $60 billion in terms of dealing with e-electronic waste uh, will be a critical uh, element uh, in the future. And then by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of digital twins? Yeah, do you have a digital twin? No, neither do I, thank God. <laughs> but do you know what digital twins are? This is a, a prototype, for example, uh, in Maria's kind introduction, she mentioned that uh, I had a think tank at Carney. This would be a, 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 an imposter think tank, a digital replica of our think tank. Or you could think of a, an industrial process, or you could think of uh, how you deal with your day here in Smith and then create a kind of a, a, a shadow or a digital twin um, and you can use this to stress test to do a number of other things. And especially now that we're seeing this massive takeoff of artificial intelligence and computational capability, we expect the digital twins will become even more significant uh, in the years ahead. Now, they represent a great opportunity on the one hand. You can work the bugs out of all kinds of things. But you can imagine on the other that they uh, carry with them a significant. So there they are, biodiversity loss, industrial policy, rapid transit, unlocking the value of e-waste, and the rise of digital twins. So it's not a question of, uh, of uh, the Hogwarts approach. In my view, what we need now is significant creativity and imagination and good hard work be thinking about how we address these and many other issues in that broad space that I outlined. So I think that uh, probably that uh, pundit who argued that it was the year of Voldemort got it all wrong. And in the end, we need to be thinking about the opportunities and the kind of significant upside potential that ultimately Barry Potter himself and others uh, brought to the whole Hogwarts story. So with that, um, I think, is this a good time maybe to invite folks to uh, to respond? Sure. Um, and we'll see what we get. But uh, please, let's hear from you. Uh, we have uh, active microphones here. And uh, thank you again for, for hearing me out and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Who would like to break the ice? the microphones in the middle. And if you do have questions, feel free to just kind of line up behind them so we're ready to we're ready to go. Well, all right, I'm out of, I'm out of it. I don't think my spot is Yes, it is. Okay. Yes. So what risks and opportunities do you see in digital twin? Could you highlight some? The digital twins. Yeah. Risks and opportunities. Okay. For example, um, if, uh, if we had seen on the, some of the aircraft now that are subject to the kind of significant uh, disruptions that we're seeing across the country, I'm talking about the MAX 7379s, right? And we saw that door incident uh, happen in Alaska. Um, the upshot there is that you could have run scenarios in advance with a digital twin um, and thought through what might have happened and what key stress points might there be. And you might, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing anything, but a potential upside would be to discover uh, weak points and then address them in terms of design. Now, what, what could go wrong? Well, in a world of misinformation and disinformation, we had the Taylor Swift uh, story about a week ago. I don't know if uh, uh, you all saw that. Um, but the whole idea of uh, a kind of uh, an alternate reality could be accentuated uh, by digital twins. 
um, they, in effect, the technologies behind digital twinning um, could make those kinds of abuses of the digital and information flows all the more pernicious. Kislea is, is uh, one of the great rock stars in the program here, Rebecca, uh, Roy, Marina, of course, you know, so I know this is going to be a very difficult question, ladies and gentlemen. I don't, yeah, you, please, you answer if I get into it. Yeah. So, uh, well, what, what place where I thought you might go with the innovations was uh, something in terms of uh, innovations in uh, in governance structures and other things. So, for instance, uh, I think we see the decline of liberalism or rise of illiberalism. We see a very polarized world. We see societies polarized within countries. And as you said, they just moving standard deviations uh, apart. So it almost seems that if we're stuck with governance structures of right up, frozen right after the Second World War. So do you see any innovations in that dimension that, uh, that might make uh, interesting things in the world? It's a great question. And I, I hope maybe you'll you'll help me answer it because I'm sure you have some, uh, some ideas on this. From my point of view, uh, there is innovation in governance now. We're seeing it in a number of ways, uh, in a number of uh, key areas across the world. Uh, and there are some governance systems, from national governance systems, from my point of view, that are heads and shoulders above uh, others. Uh, what are they? Uh, anyone here from Singapore? No? I think Singapore has one of the most amazing uh, uh, national governance structures on the planet right now. Uh, here is a small country without a lot of resources. They are strategically positioned, but they're also uh, precariously positioned in a region where there's some rough characters. Um, and they've done an extraordinary job dealing with everything from uh, 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 addressing civil society issues, to, uh, uh, to bringing along uh, senior government officials and posting them in different areas and uh, uh, in effect uh, gardening them, uh, cultivating them. Um, and, and they've done an extraordinary job in that regard. And they've had uh, excellent stability and economic prosperity over the years as well. Now, there, there are people who are going to say, well, perhaps uh, Singapore doesn't provide as many uh, individual freedoms as in other countries, and that, that certainly would be a reasonable point of view, but I think uh, they've done an extraordinarily good job. But I think when you and I, uh, be interested to hear what you think about this, but when you and I scan where things are right, um, we are seeing a lot of uh, zombie uh, government structures that they were built or they're designed now to be addressing circumstances that occurred 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, for example, do you ever watch when uh, the, uh, the, the Magnificent Seven uh, get dragged up in front of the hill from time to time as they were uh, a couple of days ago on the whole uh, uh, social media uh, uh, effects? Some of the questions are devastatingly stupid by policymakers. And it reflects the fact that they're not focused day by day on the kind of remarkable change that is, um, is, uh, is characterizes the world. Um, so how, how do they deal with quantum? Or how do they deal with CRISPR? We talked about CRISPR before. How do you do, deal with genetic editing in the future? I mean, that could be a good thing, right? But how many of you have read Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash? Anybody? Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, uh, it can be used for the wrong reasons as well. And do we have a policy process that allows us to move on this? Or what about dealing with artificial intelligence? Hard not to read about that any, uh, any, any publication you open up these days. Well, I don't think we're at a point yet where we can begin to say that we are carefully regulating 
uh, the trajectory of the arm. So the conundrum here, the predicament, is the governing structures more and more are geared toward a bygone period. And uh, they, they don't show the capacity to adapt with the monstrous innovation <laughs> going on and the, both the opportunity and diversity that uh, it engenders. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I do. I think, uh, I think in a sense, technology has created more uh, concentration of power. And I think democracy works best if it starts out at communities and devolves power. And I think we haven't found a way to devolve power back. Yeah. And the technology is just concentrated centers of power, whether it's uh, of ideological groups or individuals. Or, I, for that very same reason, I think that the possibility exists that we'll see greater economic fragmentation. We'll see uh, a spheres of influence, a kind of a Game of Thrones world, uh, where U.S. and China, you know, would it be bicameral perhaps or segmented, you know, uh, uh, by technology or by uh, by area technology in the future. But I, I really hope that we can get beyond that. There's some brilliant person in this audience or persons who can help us kind of get to a better place. Yeah. Well, says a comment. I can't believe I haven't provoked somebody. Please. So um, going back in, in like, uh, economic fragmentation, going on the other, going to the top industry is can make policies where we can bring suppliers back to the United States, not depend so much in other countries when we are going to to this economic fragmentation where also we have a lot of political. Yeah. What is, what is your uh, accent? Where are you from? Uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, welcome to my world. Uh, it's near shoring and friends shoring and reshoring and rewiring of global supply chains. Uh, we just put out a report with the World Economic Forum uh, looking at what uh, CEOs across the world are thinking about that. And the upshot is that most people feel like uh, there is a significant, uh, although as yet unidentified, uh, level of remaking of global supply chains, global value chains. Um, and that uh, what that implies is that uh, everything is going to be closer to home. But that doesn't always work well, as we know, when we still have our monstrous global economy that relies on uh, freedom of movement of, of economic factors. Um, and so I think that we're headed for a collision um, between uh, policymakers who are pushing these industry policies um, uh, and, and really pushing protectionism um, in one way or another. Um, and the notion that uh, they'll lose the benefits of, uh, of unhindered cross-border movement of, of uh, economic factors. Um, that could become a big deal, ultimately. So the question is, are we going to get a negative uh, uh, end of history on this? Will we see a continued deceleration of globalization? Um, and will we see continued uh, decline in democracy in the capacity to, uh, to move in governance systems? And the answer is, uh, you know, those French speakers here, on verra, we'll see. Uh, but uh, I hope to goodness that, you know, what's, what's going on, you know, all over Puerto Rico is a classic example, for example. You've got a whole range of governance and also environmental issues with the, the extreme weather that you've uh, experienced, the adversity that has, the, that has befallen the island time and time again is so significant right now. And then we've had changes in legislation, both here in the US and in San Juan uh, itself, 
Uh, we've seen, for example, uh, uh, shifts in the uh, tax benefits for pharmaceuticals who are active in Puerto Rico. We see new incentives now that we're trying to put into place. Uh, very, you know, it's challenging for all of us at, at all times, and I think it will become all the more challenging in the future. Please. There's a, there's a question right here in the second oh, row. Already, that's the question. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Not to trump you. I'm just sure. <laughs> Hello, how are you? How are you? Uh, my name is Abdul. I'm a master student in supply chain management. So my question basically is in regards to transportation and technology. So in terms of transportation, we've really seen a rise in um electric vehicles in um, transportation, and there's um, positive impacts in the environment. But that's mainly passenger transport. So that's mainly um, smaller vehicles transporting passengers from people from point A to B. But my um, area of interest is um, cargo transport. So that's you know moving cargo up and down the country. So what does technology have in store for um, heavy duty vehicles moving for 10 years time, can we see a rapid rise in electric trucks and so on and so forth? Um, I think the short answer to that is yes. A rapid rise of uh, electric vehicle trucks or transport uh, in the future. And my guess is, as I've suggested in this uh, rapid transit point that I raised, is that across uh, transportation, we're likely to see continued uh, transition uh, outside of fossil, fossil fuel-based approach. Uh, we'll have new, uh, new uh, fuels uh, at work. You know, we saw the, the flight, the uh, transatlantic flight uh, with uh, non-fossil non fuel recently. And, and uh, there are a number of other examples that I think are likely to shift uh, things. Trucks, um, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. And uh, I believe too, the whole notion of convoying and a range of other factors. If, if our leadership has, has the, uh, the uh, wisdom to develop a, a transportation infrastructure conducive to this, and, and after all, we have to think about charging capabilities and a whole range of other kind of broader systemic approaches to making it happen. Uh, but I really, I, I, I see this remarkable shift away from fossils uh, into electric uh, in the years to come. Please. Um, we what want to make mean? sure that the, the recording will be done. I can show too. <laughs> 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 have <laughs> You can have one. So I wanted to know a little bit more about um, the waste management that you've mentioned, and if you've seen some of um, some innovation in that sense, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, what have you seen, and what are the the future um, of waste management? And is there any, let's say, profitability in that sense for business and um, private industry in general? So the last part of your question, yes, we do see profitability. Um, and it, it, and I, I think that it, it's about time we're seeing this now. Because uh, for far too long, we've been throwing away um, electrical stuff. Um, and uh, as you're aware, uh, there are a number of uh, toxic elements you know, inside that uh, we need to be treating uh, favorably. And, yeah, I don't know if you've all seen uh, the reports, but there are a number of uh, there are a number of areas elsewhere in the world where people are engaging in kind of barehanded um, uh, e-waste practices that are horrible uh, for human health and not providing them with much uh, by way of subsistence uh, support. Um, so the sooner we get going on this, the better, as far as we're concerned. Um, and what can be what can be done? Uh, first of all, there's a recycling phenomenon. 
there's a possibility too that we could be finding and, and recycling uh, critical minerals and materials that would otherwise just be uh, be lost. Um, so this is win, win, win all the way around as far as I'm concerned. And uh, we need a lot of imagination and creativity to make this, to accelerate the process going into the future. But personal story, ladies and gentlemen, it's a little embarrassing, but uh, I can't, I can't throw out a computer no matter how old it is. And I have this pile of apples uh, in my house. And finally, my wife got so mad at me uh, that she said, You've got to get rid of it. So I took them into an Apple store and I said, this is your e-waste, you take it. And uh, they did, they did. And they got an e-waste program going right now. I have no idea what happened to those laptops after I dropped them. I know that they were non-functional, uh, but uh, I hope to goodness that uh, they, they had a better outcome than they would have otherwise. So with the need of innovations becoming more prominent, how do you see developing countries fitting into this, especially because a lot of the innovations that are made, like, were made like in the past have already been at the expense of the countries? So I just want to know how you see that going. Great question. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that they will be able to get um, a significant share of innovation. Um, you know, when you're dealing with quantum, for example, you're talking about the, the uh, commitment of billions of dollars, billions and billions of research and everything else. It would be very difficult for many uh, countries with fewer resources to mobilize. Um, so then the question becomes, well, how will they fit in this framework when they're kind of core technology hubs in the major uh, economic powers that are doing more work in these areas. I think that we ought to be watching at five core fourth industrial revolution technologies, artificial intelligence, internet of things, broader computational power stuff, uh, 3D printing, which we're seeing wider affluence uh, at any given moment, um, AR, VR, we're seeing that now with the whole meta thing coming out. Um, and then on top of that, finally, uh, advanced robotics. Um, and then add to that nano and bio, the whole CRISPR and the broader bio revolution going on right now. And there are very few hubs in the world um, that are doing this. And then uh, a lot of it feeds off one another, these, these benefits. And so that, that there are a number of countries that won't have the benefit of, of that. Um, so we're, I think that there'll be a rebalancing of the global economy in the future. And that, uh, you know, leaders in various countries, including developing countries, are going to have to try to figure out, well, how do we address this, this challenge? Do we need to engage in alliances or regional approaches or, um, or um, uh, create uh, new organizational approaches through NGOs or partnerships or whatever? Uh, but uh, I think it's going to be a challenge. We have time for one last question. Anybody wants to ask a question? Eric, thank you for talking with us today. My name is Islamia Aina. I'm a county and national development major. So my question has to be more with environmental sustainability, but also created with rapid transit. So probably like a year ago, I did a special like project on Southwest. We were like studying more of like alternative fuels that place we use, but they also depended on like using more of like the waste from like crops in order to make that fuel. So if we already have a problem with like losing like certain biodiversity within our country and like around the world, how are we going to be able to address environmental issues? being able to like find different type of fuels for these rapid transits. It's a great point. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Look, here's the way I see it. Um, I was influenced by an article that came out about six months ago looking at so-called planetary boundaries. And they, they looked at nine of them. And biodiversity was one of them. But uh, they looked at global warming, the, you know, the other ones that you would expect. 
um, the use of land, uh, land uh, practices, that kind of thing. Um, and this was an incredibly, incredibly respected group of scientists who concluded that of these nine planetary boundaries were now beyond the comfort zone in six of them. And biodiversity clearly was one of them. But the way I see it now is that uh, if you look at the aggregate stresses of the economy as we know it now, on the broader environment, which we rely on to sustain uh, us and uh, that, that economic uh, activity in the future, uh, it's becoming more tenuous by the day. Um, so, you know, uh, everybody has these crazy statistics in terms of water use or land degradation or deforestation or uh, a loss of biodiversity. So in my view now, sorry, that's me. <laughs> so th this is a, a, a note saying you're being too Voldemortish. I apologize. But I think I think when we look at the uh, basket of the economic challenges right now, um, that we need to be thinking about how we morph those into new approaches to environmental sustainability, or how we think about uh, how how we might translate this into better governance practices, or or finding new new kind of ways to develop uh, partnerships across. In new pockets of trust among demographic segments and other other groups, um, and here's where the innovation comes in. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to leave you all with a challenge here. This this is the big challenge. We we will we will uh, succeed or fail depending on how well we take on the future. And innovation is where it all happens, and that's where I love to see, especially younger people, kind of get their teeth into the big problems and then come up with new approaches and new ideas. So I'd like to invite you, uh, if nothing else, to think about some of the things that we've talked about tonight, the challenges, and then wonder, well, how, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do to take this on? And who knows? You know, maybe one or the other, or many of you will strike a goal. Um, I hope you do. And in the meantime, thank you so very much for hearing me out tonight.